Good evening. My name is Alfreda Norman, and I have the pleasure of serving as the board chair for Communities Foundation of Texas. I regret I can't be there with you in person this evening, but I'm so glad you've joined us for this incredibly special cause-minded conversation. CFT's intent with this signature series is to provide a space for diverse thinkers and doers to discuss community issues in the hopes that the conversations will continue and result in positive, sustainable, meaningful action far beyond this event. Tonight, we will witness two of our community's dedicated leaders reconnecting and reflecting on the accommodation, an important book for the understanding of our city's history. It has been out of print for years, but it's soon to be re-released by Deep Vellum, a nonprofit independent publisher based here in Dallas. We are honored to work in partnership with Deep Vellum to host this conversation tonight with journalist and author of The Accommodation, Jim Schultz, and Dallas County Commissioner John Wally Price, who has written the foreword for this new edition. Tonight's event is a special one for our city, for Jim and John, for Deep Vellum, and for all of us who are committed to leaning in and learning from our history, even when it's uncomfortable. Our vision at the Communities Foundation of Texas is a thriving community for all. One of the ways we do that is by creating connections and opportunities for enriching experiences that help us better see and understand each other, discover where we live, and dream about the community we want to build together. Thank you for being here tonight. I'd now like to introduce CFT's Senior Vice President and Chief Giving and Community Impact Officer, Monica Edgard-Smith. Thank you. As Alfreda shared, our vision at CFT is a community where all can thrive. This vision hinges upon our ability to collectively advance community equity. To do that effectively, we must learn from and reconcile with our own challenging past and history. And it's not just here in Dallas that we're grappling with this history. Conversation and action are happening and need to continue to happen across our nation. Reading and discussing the accommodation is one way for us to begin to understand the broader context of our community's past and what it means for our community members today. We're here tonight as part of our commitment to be unafraid, to lean in, and to learn how to chart a path forward. When we learned that Deep Vellum would be re-releasing Jim Schutz's The Accommodation, we saw an opportunity to spark, inspire, and convene a citywide discussion about Dallas's history of race and politics and how we got to where we are today. We know many residents and leaders are grappling with the racial reckoning of this past year and have a desire to better understand the history and dynamics that brought us to this point. As corporations and civic organizations alike analyze their efforts in creating more equitable workspaces and communities, the accommodation and the conversations surrounding it provide a platform for us to examine our own beloved city and events of the past that continue to shape its future. Speaking of history, we are here tonight at the Pittman Hotel because of its important historical significance. This hotel used to be the home of the historic Knights of Pythias Temple, the first commercial building in Dallas built by and for African-American professionals. It was originally designed in 1916 by prominent African-American architect and son-in-law of Booker T. Washington, William S. Pittman, the trailblazer for whom the hotel is named. This building was home to many businesses and hosted numerous high profile events in this very ballroom. The original grandeur of this historic landmark has been restored and fused with new contemporary construction to once again serve as a place for community, connecting past to present. Our friends here at the Pittman have just celebrated their one year anniversary and we hope that you'll be back to visit them very soon. Yes. Communities Foundation of Texas is more committed than ever to leading from our unique position as a hub for philanthropy here in North Texas. The need continues to be great, and over the next nine days, we have the opportunity to raise much needed dollars for nonprofits to meet their missions across North Texas. 
CFT's North Texas Giving Day is fast approaching and early giving is open now. You can give to more than 3,300 nonprofits at NorthTexasGivingDay.org. You can search by organizations that have a racial equity and inclusion statement. You can search by organizations led by people of color or those that primarily serve people of color. And you can search by nonprofits by location, cause area, size, and many more different categories. We encourage you to use the Giving Day website to get to know some organizations that you might not otherwise previously have known about. On September 23rd, join us to be part of a community-wide movement to lift our region, to be the good, and to show up for one another and celebrate generosity. Our nonprofits, including Deep Vellum and KERA, our partners here tonight, they need your generous donations, your commitment to service, and your advocacy for their work. And we hope that you'll encourage your friends, your neighbors, and your colleagues to give on North Texas Giving Day as well. I'd now like to introduce Will Evans, the founder of local nonprofit, nonprofit publishing house, Deep Vellum, who has been working tirelessly to bring this book into its second life. Will, we appreciate you for partnering with us, and I'm gonna turn things over to you to introduce our speakers. What's up, Dallas? What's up, world? Uh, I want to give a shout out to everybody watching on the live stream right now. I want to thank KERA. I want to thank Communities Foundation of Texas. I want to thank Commissioner John Wiley Price. I want to thank Jim Schutz. I want to thank the Deep Ellum staff, board members, friends, and all the Dallas residents who've come out tonight to celebrate a book. Every city, as we all know, has a story. Every one of you is a character in a story, probably many stories. Deep Ellum was founded with the mission that Dallas has a story and the world has a story, and that it's up to us to capture that lightning in the bottle and turn a story into a book. And what is a book? A book is a conversation, a conversation between a reader and a writer, a conversation between cultures, a conversation across eras, a conversation, a dialogue. It's not a one-way street. Our mission at Deep Vellum is to publish books and to make public works of literary art that change the world we're a part of for the better. We publish authors from Dallas, publish a lot of authors from Dallas, many of whom are in the room tonight, I should say. We publish authors from cities and countries and languages that you might not have heard of, like Malayalam, right? Lubumbashi, Congo. We have an author with four books from that city. This is what it's all about, to bring the world into conversation through literature. And it starts from right here in our, back door, in our own backyard. To be a publisher in Dallas means that we need to open a door to conversations that were not happening before we existed. So what is the one story of Dallas? The one to show what's possible with the power of the literary arts. The, the entire value of being a literary arts nonprofit in Dallas, Texas is about sharing stories that were not being shared before. There's a book called The Accommodation. It was written around the time I was born in a city I'm not from. And when I moved to Dallas in 2013, I met an amazing group of individuals who are affiliated with D Magazine, one of whom is here tonight, Kristen Nightingale, who, with, with the leadership of D, has started a program to engage those who wanted to be a part of Dallas and to share the stories in the many layers of this city. And everyone in that class, I was learning so much from them. They all said, oh, you're a publisher in Dallas. You got to publish the accommodation. <laughs> and so I said, <clears throat> that sounds complicated. <laughs> let me grow and let Deep Vellum grow to the point where we might be able to share this story. And the time came. And due to tragic events in our city and around the country last year, there came a time when the accommodation had to come out. The story could no longer sit in the inboxes and desktop computers as an illegal PDF <laughs> among everybody in the room tonight, <laughs> myself included. And I want to thank those who went to the library and blessed the public library for all that they do and scanned that book and made available this work for someone like me to move to Dallas and to find that story and to share it with readers like you, maybe those who didn't have the PDF hookup. 
to take out of the inbox and make public. This is what publishing is all about. This, the Accommodation is a vital book for Dallas. It's a book that starts to ask the question of why Dallas is the way that it is. And every book, when done right, is a door opening into another world. It is a portal into another dimension, another conversation to say, how did we get here? Who are we? Where do we come from? And more importantly for Deep Vellum as a literary arts nonprofit, to partner with organizations like Community Foundation of Texas for events just like this to ask the question, how do we move forward from here? A book is a living, breathing, eternal document. A text lives forever. And together, we can take the story and move forward. This is a unique opportunity, not to say that this one book has all the answers, but that it is a door for us all to walk through. And if you read this book, you're a part of a larger conversation. And we need everyone in this room's voice, everyone watching the live stream at home, everyone in our city to engage so that this city can be better tomorrow than it is today. That is the goal of publishing the accommodation. The next step in that is that next fall, uh, Deep Vellum, in partnership with a list of organizations I'm going to read you because it's extraordinary, Better Block, City of Dallas Office of Equity and Inclusion, Communities Foundation of Texas, Dallas Public Library, Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, D Magazine, and Deep Vellum, we're going to get together and we're going to do a citywide read of the accommodation. We're going to give away at least 25,000 copies of a paperback version of the book that you can get tonight in the foyer, sold by Pan-African Connection, the amazing, legendary black-owned bookstore in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Who have been a part of this city and its literary history long before I ever showed up. And they'll be here probably long after I'm gone, but support them. Buy the books tonight and continue to go visit them at their amazing bookstore and community center. But we are going to get together with a citywide read of this book. And the whole point of that is to have a conversation with the youth to give away these 25,000 copies of the book to high schoolers, juniors, and seniors across the county so that we can begin to ask and answer the questions of who are the future leaders and how can they engage with the current leaders so that we can listen and learn from each other. Nobody can do this alone. We are all connected. And Deep Vellum's mission is to use books as a way to bring conversations together. We know that is not the only way. We need you, your organizations, and your voice to stand up. You have heard more than enough from Will Evans of Deep Vellum, but I would like to thank everyone who has helped make this book possible. There's a lot of people in this room. I, to do a list would go on forever. Their names are in the backs of the books. They're on our website. But more importantly, there are three people in the room I'd like to introduce you to right now with stories to share. And that's Jim Schutz, Commissioner John Wiley Price, and Noelle Laveau, who are going to have a conversation about this book. Thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you, Noelle. Steps. There are no steps. <laughs> there are no steps. <laughs> oh, I'm this way. I was going to help you guys out. But. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm break, 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 break the color. Right. Break up the color. All right. Well, we're going to jump right into it because I know that this audience really wants to hear from the two of you here together, right? <laughs> so. Commissioner Price, I'm going to start with you. Can well, you? Well, first of all, before we, before we <laughs> begin, and I, I want to thank Communities Foundation as well, um, primarily because of the staging and where we are. Uh, she talked a little bit about William Sidney Pittman, the only son-in-law of Booker T. Washington, married his daughter, Portia. Uh, they are interned in the cemetery over off of Elsie Faye Hagen's behind uh, Lincoln High School. And, and I say that because the temple, the Knights of Pythias Temple, was the citadel in this community of black economics. Whether you dealt with insurance and all, and at the end of the day tonight, I'm gonna talk about how this whole rise of the black middle class in Dallas was kind of commensurate with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and the John Birch Society. So as Will said, it was so timely for this book to be released, given what has happened on the national stage. 
And the last thing I will say is, it was interesting as we watched the Greenwoods and the Rosewoods and the bombings across this country, not one time did they mention Dallas. I just find that peculiar. And so we'll talk, get a chance to talk a little bit more about that. We will. Okay. But first, I want to ask you a little bit about the two of you. Can you give us a little history? I'll start with you, Commissioner Price, about your relationship and the accommodation. Well, somebody said a few minutes ago, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Jim was this brash young journalist from a place called Detroit. And I knew anybody uh, that uh, looked like Jim who came out of Detroit was gonna be okay. And he came here, and at that time, for those of you who just got to town, uh, we were a, a two-horse uh, newspaper town. We had something called the Dallas Times-Herald and the Dallas Morning News. And Jim was with the uh, Times-Herald. And you know, we got a chance to, to meet. A lot of you are not going to recall uh, an incident whereby um, the community rallied around a supposedly satirical uh, piece called Joe Bob Briggs. And it was making fun of hunger, uh, starvation in the, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the African community, the, the continent of Africa. And we put together a, a delegation and we approached the paper. And so again, got a chance to, to meet this guy named Jim Schultz and uh, still was querying myself as, where did he come from? And so, but, <laughs> but you know, we did. We, we formed a great relationship. And uh, Jim brought one thing to Dallas that we had not seen. And that was uh, real, real courage. Nice. But uh, when we were talking about the Joe Bob thing, I didn't give you any inside information from the Times Herald, right? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Well, I was going to ask if you had anything to add, but I think we'll just stop okay. that there. Okay, okay. Um, so, Jim, for many of our guests who have not read the PDF email version that went around, um, would you describe the accommodation and really why you wrote it when you wrote it? Yeah, that's a, a, a question. People ask me why I wrote it, and I, I realized recently that I've offered a bunch of answers over the years, and uh, I don't think any of them quite got to it. I, I looked back at the book recently. I hadn't reread it in a long time, and uh, I, I was half my current age when I wrote it. And I realized when I read it that the guy who wrote it was angry, that there was a, an angry voice in it that I had, had sort of forgotten over the years. There were things about Dallas that made me angry. There was a smugness. There was a story that Dallas had never had any racial upheaval, that everybody loved things the way they were. Uh, when I complained about it to my fellow, I was a part of a group of Yankee carpetbaggers who came to the Times Herald. <laughs> and I would talk to them about it. And they'd say, you just don't like it because everybody here gets along. Everything's cool here. And I really questioned myself. And then one day I'm riding down the street listening to the radio. And it comes on and the guy says, but one black man disagreed. <laughs> <laughs> and this voice comes out of the radio. <laughs> he, he was a clerk to Cleophas Steele, uh, Justice of the Peace Court judge. And it was like. Uh, Gideon before the, I mean, you know, it was a biblical voice. And he, he was saying, this city is not going to stay the way it is. And I'm going to see that it doesn't. And uh, I looked him up so fast, we had lunch that day. And uh, in, in the ensuing years, you know, I, I watched him uh, really pull the city forward single-handedly for a long time. When I left Detroit in 1978, everybody was John Wiley Price. And when I came to Dallas, there was only one guy yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. in the city who was John Price. 
So I heard you say that when you were getting ready to publish it, that you knew you kind of had to do it quickly because there was going to be some resistance. Yes. Tell me a little bit about how you knew that. What was going on? Well, the editor of the book, a, a guy named Bobby Frazee at Taylor, was calling me up every day and saying, hurry up. Uh, somebody at your paper at the Times Herald is talking to the Citizens Council, and they are bugging these guys at Taylor about the book. Taylor had changed ownership. Right. They had a national owner, and so the new guys didn't quite get it. Like, you, you're what council? Mm -hmm. <laughs> are you the, you know, they're, just, they're in that phase where people are trying to figure things out. But Bobby was saying, you've got to hurry up or, or they're going to succeed in killing the book before it comes out. And indeed, the day it was on the presses, they put the plates on the presses to run, it, they pulled them off the presses. And uh, the New York Times did a story about the book being suppressed, and then a small publisher in New Jersey said he would publish it. Mm. What were your thoughts about that? Did you hear when that was going on? Well, yes, but I mean, that was the essence of the White Citizens Council. He didn't, he didn't use the adjective, but I mean, that's what it is. I mean, now, you know, they have some folks who look like me, but has the mission really changed? They would like to say, I mean, over the years, I've been here when I've seen, you know, Dallas together, Dallas coming together. And it was always about trying to offset the Citizens Council. Right. Was, yeah, and, and so, you know, at the end of the day, the power was, was centralized in that Citizens Council. And while traditionally, even in the book, when Jim talks about how they tried to uh, recruit, and, and, and individuals who were basically stalwarts in our community, I mean, the W.J. Durham's of the world, when you talk about, you know, the litigations, uh, you know, the Bunkleys, those, they tried just to basically, as he said, accommodate them. But they were not part of the power structure decision making in this community. And the fact that, you know, he had to go through all, does not surprise me at all. The people won't believe this, but the commissioner and I don't always agree on everything. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I, I think, I don't know about the mission of the Citizens Council. I think it's changed. I can't, I, maybe I'm simple-minded, but I look at it and I see an African-American CEO and a recent past chairman who's black. When, I, when the book came out, I may, I may never have told you this, I, my editor told me I had been called to appear before the Citizens Council. Whatever that meant. And I went to this building and I sat down in this like little kid chair and there were these guys in a raised dais and they said, uh, Mr. Schutz, what do black people want? And I said, you know, things are really complicated these days about <laughs> ethnicity and sometimes we make mistakes. I said, you guys know that I'm white, right? <laughs> and, 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 and they said, yes, of course we know that. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I'd be a lot more comfortable if you asked a black person to come here and answer that question. And I walked out of there thinking, wow, that's, this is like 1920. Mm -hmm. So I think we've moved from there. Well, <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe we've wrenched toward the door. But, you know, a lot has not changed. Now, in Jim's book, rem remember, he talks about the spook who sat by the door, okay? So it, while he is, is, is being a lot more cuddly now, uh, <laughs> because, you know, uh, you know, and it has something to do with age. I, oh, I, I it's, a, it's an yeah, old thing. thing. Yeah. But, you know, you know I, and, and I would like to think that. I, I, I know, knew the, um, I know the past chair. Uh, I know the individual there now. But just because it, that symbols versus substance, what substantively has changed as a result? And, and again, I'm going to get into this whole thing about what, you know, what the, uh, as you talk about infrastructure and all, uh, you know, and I call it white folks' welfare. I mean, African Americans, Hispanics, we have to fight for the crumbs. 
you know, black lives cannot matter until black economics matter. That's what I like about this piece here. This was the Citadel for a middle class black community. And so the fact that, you know, now that you put a few black faces and brown faces, what substantially has changed? Mm -hmm. I find myself every day, 36 years, elected office, still fighting for the basics. For the basics, are you going to include people who look like me? Mr. M Mr. Pittman went to Tuskegee. Mr. Pittman graduated from Drexel. Mr. Pittman built communities all around, but when he got to Dallas in the 20s, he built this and he built St. James, and boom, the door closed in Dallas. So, you know, I, you know, I, I just don't see a lot this, this, this change. So tell me what you think, kind of in that context, what do you think releasing this book now will mean to the, the culture and the society in Dallas now? Well, you know, notwithstanding critical race theory and teaching <laughs> what's, what's gone on, I, I think it's, 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 it's imperative that we need to know the history. And I think Will said it a few minutes ago, why Dallas is kind of like it is. There have been some people in here. Um, one of my favorite authors is uh, a woman named Robert D'Angelo. She wrote White Fragility, but she also wrote a new book. A new book is called Nice, nice Racism. And everybody wants to be nice. Like, and you still say, you know, we're getting along. We got some black people in place. But when you look at the bottom line, Nothing has is, is, is really, is, is really changed. Do you realize there are billions of dollars in public sector that are in this, in this community? Any of your audience, anyone looking, I dare them to look and see who has been the GC, the general contractors. You know, I mean, anybody can take a shovel and dig a hole. But can they design the projects? Are they partners on the project? That's, that's at the end of the day, and nothing has changed. Jim, what are your thoughts? Well, the, the commissioner knows what he's talking about, and absolutely, in, in 40 years of covering City Hall and the schools and so on, I certainly learned that the real story is who gets to build that bridge, who gets to build that school. That's, that's where the money is, and that's what the power cares about. Uh, but I really do sense a some a, a huge change on the horizon. The commissioner mentioned critical uh, race theory, which is so, I mean, this, the, this book coming back has everything to do with that. The, the, the critical race theory thing comes straight out of George Floyd and people saying that eight minutes gave us a window that we've got to close. We, we've got to put a, we've got to find a way not to look in that window. And so they think that they're going to ban the teaching of our history. And that's exactly what was attempted to be done with the book originally. Mm -hmm. But when uh, Will Evans mentioned the, the bootleg PDF copies of it, I just became aware of that 15 years ago. And I wondered, who, who's looking at these? And then I would get invited to groups to talk about it. And everybody was 30 years old, 20, in their 20s, all young people. And they had come into the city. They see this Mason-Dixon line across the middle of the city, and they realize something happened here. Mm -hmm. That we haven't been given the story. This physical reality on the ground doesn't match the story. And so, thank goodness, young people have, are born with healthy disrespect for their elders. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so they, and, and so they, found their way to this book as a way of. of getting at the story just as they will, even, even if these fools manage to pass laws saying that you can't teach uh, the history, the people will find their way to it mm -hmm. one way or the other. And I think this book is an example. Did you ever imagine the re-release like this? No, uh, I didn't. Um, the commissioner told me that I should get it republished and I tried for a long time and then I, he, I said, okay, you get it published. <laughs> and then he tried for a long time. And then he 
called me up and said, I can't get this loser published. <laughs> and I said, I said, that's what I told you. Uh, and, and so it sat there for a long time. And it, boy, it took some kind of real sea change. I, I met somebody here this evening who wrote a check to get it going. It takes that. <laughs> takes a substantial check, yeah. but no, it, I, I really didn't envision it. So Commissioner Price, you wrote the foreword to the re-release. Yeah. What did you think needed to be added to the book? Well, I, 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 think, I think that an old white guy needed uh, a, uh, someone to kind of block for him coming into the queue. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So, you know, Jim, Jim didn't need, Jim really didn't need any validation. And, and we've got this, you know, this uh, relationship, his wife will probably talk to her about later. But anyway, we've got this relationship um, that, you know, Jim has basically laid the groundwork. He talked about that Mason-Dixie line a few minutes ago. He may have called it imaginary line. We call it I-30. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's the same. And, and you know, and the and the travesty is when we look at this book. Uh, and and by the way, for those of you who just got to Dallas, black people did not begin in South Dallas. The book talks about bombing. You know, when you go out where Galleria is, I, I still take care of cemeteries out there right now. White Rock Cemetery is over behind uh, the Galleria. I, I am in charge of the public service to take care of historical cemeteries. And that's where black people began. And the migration to push south, you know, and I won't talk, I saw Dr. Ann Oz here earlier, uh, I, I won't tell you what uh, W.T. White did uh, with regards to uh, Valley View and all that land. When you go out there and you see African Americans on Mac Shan Road, which we call Doctor's Row, African American, but that's because that's where the black community was. That was the black community. So the migration began in the push south. But when it seems like when he got to 30, even though we've, we've jumped 30, when you look at community health needs assessment, by the way, that's an assessment of what the, what the medical needs are in this community. People north of 30, live 22 years more than people south. Mm -hmm. When you look at broadband, we pay more for broadband south and it's not there. You think the pandemic, everybody talks about uh, everything from food desert, we got the internet desert, you know, got food <laughs> deserts, I mean, you, you, you name it. And, and then uh, I, I'll definitely talk about, you know, where you talk about M, MWB, you know, minority women, business enterprises. All of this is, is, is still what this book was talking about that's basically embedded in the DNA of this community. And so I still say hashtag very little has changed. Oh, we, you know, we could, you know, we could now go in the, <clears throat> the front door. Jim. Well, <clears throat> and, and I think a lot of really interesting work has been done in the last year. DISD has done a big chunk of it in going back and digging out the deliberate policies that created those deserts. They didn't just happen by accident. Okay. In fact, the maps that were drawn by the federal government in the 30s <clears throat> You can't have mortgages here. We don't care what your credit rating is. It's called redlining. Redlining and, and the withholding of basic civic in infrastructure like sewers and curbs and water. All of that was the result of a very deliberate policy. And I thought it was really interesting and exciting that in the last school bond issue, a part of it was not a huge part, but a part of it was set aside deliberately to go back and, and remediate that action, but, but the larger important theme is none of this happened by accident. Well, and, and I'll agree with that. However, I want anyone, I want you to, to count on one hand how many of those charter schools are north yeah. of I-30, okay? Mm -hmm. 
you know, while we understand what DISD has done, the proliferation of our community with these schools has impact, as far as I'm concerned, public education in a way. We, you know, when we were doing a lot of the uh, picketing and protesting, we talked about schools in the community and the assignment of, of personnel, which has impact. You know, you, you, can, you can talk about education. It's one thing to put up the structure, but if you don't put up the real infrastructure, which is the, the teachers, and, 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 and the same thing happened with uh, Lincoln High School. Lincoln High School was the communications magnet. Brian Adams had more than Lincoln had in terms of equipment, in terms of teaching. And so, while, again, I'm on symbols versus substance. You, you, you place town view in the African-American community. What was the qualification to get into town view? And did you ever look, by the way, I think it was D Magazine and everybody else has talked about how it's premier school and its location and all. look at the population. You won't believe this, but the commissioner and I do not agree about everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, let's talk about, you know, when people, when North Texans really do read this book, you're talking about what things you would like to see differently. So when you read this book, there are a lot of people, like I said, here that haven't read it yet. What do you want them to do next? Like, what, what are the things that people, individuals, can do to make some of these shifts and changes that we're talking about? Well, CHNA, um, a community health needs assessment, for the last, uh, I've been a commissioner for 36 years. I know that's longer than most of you wanted me to be there, but I'm there. <laughs> <clears throat> and for the last 30 years, last three decades, the zip codes in terms of disparity have been the same. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. And, and through the CHNA, the Community Health Needs Assessment, Parkland, and the Health and Human Service, for the first time in this budget, has got an engagement where we began to deal with that. Dr. Martin Luther King talks about all kinds of social injustice. He said, but health care is the most egregious. And, 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 and here we're talking about your, your, your zip code determining the length of life, <laughs> you know, m more than your, your, your life goal. I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about is that where are the residents, I'm gonna go back to Citizens Council. They, I'm sure they, they get together. Uh, <laughs> what? Where's the resolutions? I, I want to see resolutions. You can talk about public policy if you want to, but at the end of the day, there's got to be resolutions. You've got to begin to talk about, you know, this, this whole uh, um, custody system, penitentiary system, you know, you take people and you still release them in, in 2021 and what you give them, $50 or is it up to $100 now? What is it? And you release them back in and you have no workforce training. I, do, I have seen Dallas College as, as they help uh, the regional black contractors through programs, get OSHA 10 and OSHA 30, because otherwise you're putting people on probation, parole, you're doing the same recycling, they're in our community. I mean, what do you expect? And we spend your taxpayer money just in Dallas County, and we're just a holding facility. We're spending $10 million for less than 6,000 people every month just to hold them. And just, and just think, if you, if you looked at those zip codes and those people and said, here is this incredible resource. What if these kids, instead of being steered to prison, were steered to college? What if all these folks were in the mix, at the table, in the game, bringing their creativity and their inventiveness and their courage to making this a better place, instead of deliberately, by policy, pushing them out? Uh, I don't know how many times I found myself on some story in Southern Dallas where I'm supposed to go get some man on the street thing and I'm in a vacant lot by a barrel fire and there are six guys standing around it at, at two in the afternoon 
and you talk to them and you realize this guy should be a lawyer, that guy should be a symphony conductor, this one should you know, be a CEO, and instead they got pushed out of school without full literacy, sold drugs, went to prison twice, now they're out, they're not fully literate, they're ex-cons, and the society says you can never have a decent job. We will never let you have a decent job. So they're, they're not imprisoned anymore. It's worse almost. They're out prison. They have to live in the midst of all this prosperity and everything else, and they can't have that much of it. What if all those lives were turned around and brought into the tent instead of pushed out? Yeah. So I have one final question. Um, you know, we talk about this story being suppressed for as long as it was. I'll ask both of you. What's one other story that you think has been suppressed that you would like to see shared? Mm. Well, I, <laughs> I have one because uh, I was in the newspaper business for a long time. And it's funny because the newspaper business, we wag our fingers at everybody else and tell them what they're doing wrong <laughs> and so on. And, uh, and there probably isn't another business that was more chauvinist mm -hmm. about women than the newspaper business. And, and it's an, just an example of how there's another huge story of, of potential and creativity and power that's been pushed out of the tent. And I don't know where Dallas scores on all of that. Uh, probably not as bad as some places, but still with a long way to go. Yeah. You know, if I, the, the, the story of potential, as Jim talked about, human potential, is the economic potential uh, in the southern sector. As we talk about the Urban Land Institute, the money, let me just tell you, the synergy that is, is uh, beginning to culminate around that area has, has brought the interest as far as what's going on in Louisiana, uh, the whole plaque of mines piece, what's going on with uh, Travis County. That's the story of we can build a community of, of, of affordability and workforce in a way that, that at least begins to give people um, a chance. People can't afford to live around deep Ellum anymore. Mm -hmm. They, they, they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. Most people can't afford to live in mostly Dallas proper mm -hmm. anymore. So where are the, I don't like the word visionary, where, where are the doers, where are the thinkers? And, to, and that's what I really like about um, this new Dr. Eric uh, Johnson. He gets it. He's been in Detroit. He's been in Washington. He's been in New Orleans. He gets it, and, and, and until we can bring those kind of synergies into the southern sector, that's the only place, and, and, and build the real infrastructure. I mean, I'm the only commissioner that, that will tell you, I'm, I'm building underground water storage, I'm building towers, I'm building pump stations, because we don't have what everybody else takes for granted. I didn't quite hear, which Eric Johnson was it you were? Doctor, <laughs> doctor, <laughs> doctor <laughs> Eric Johnson. As, as we know. Yeah, 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 he's a physician, okay. economic engineer. But you know what, and the last thing I really want to say, it, to talking about Jim and his book, let me tell you something. African American people for, the, for, for years have, about, have talked about dying and going to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. The new citadel for African American economics. Let me tell you something. The purveyor, the designer, the architect of all of that came out of Dallas. Maynard Jackson came out of Dallas and left here, was pushed out of here, and went to Atlanta and built it. I'm telling you, he, he talked about the potential that we've run off. There's a lot still here. We've, we've run off a lot of potential. Because Dallas is not considered to be an accommodating. Even if you talk to Dr. Johnson, people say, well, you going to Dallas? Oh, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. Dallas still, I know, I know most of us sitting here, oh, well, John, we still don't really have that aura. You do. 
it's still there. That mist is still there. And we, we appreciate the Community Foundation and all, but you've got a lot of work to still do. Sure, and I think that, you know, we land on potential, right? I think we land tonight's conversation on potential because I think that what I get out of this conversation is the passion, the dedication, the sacrifice that both of you have made over all of those years, right, to pay the way. And I believe that that's a starting point for so many of us. Pick up the book, read the book, and let's do some of the changes that we need to make and work together to do that. I want to thank you both for your time tonight. Thank you. Um, can we just give one more round of applause to Commissioner Price, to Mr. Schutz, and to Noel? Um, we, we just want to honor you and thank you for grounding us in history and honesty and doing it with grace and humor. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Chris McSwain, and I have the joy and honor as serving as the Community uh, Engagement Director for North Texas Giving Day, which again is in nine days. Um, and I just want to share that conversations like this one are really a conduit for healing and redemption and connection. Um, it's really an opportunity for people who are from different places above I-30 and beyond I-30 to come together um, and get uncomfortable together. So I appreciate you all being here for leaning in. Um, as Monica said earlier, we at CFT are doing the work to acknowledge the gaps and challenges and educate ourselves and take bold steps to ensure that our community thrives in all ways. CFT recognizes and our responsibility as a community leading organization that is also a community learning organization. We're in the process even now of diving deeply into our own history and uncovering parts of our own story that need to share, learn from, and as a community that we need to heal through. So nights like these are pivotal for us, and we truly hope that they're pivotal for you too. And so if you're wondering what happens now, there are a few action steps that we can take. And so Monica mentioned it earlier, but you can give. Uh, North Texas Giving Day is on the 23rd, and we've been very intentional this year uh, about making sure that you can filter by organizations that are doing this work, racial equity work, organizations that are serving uh, historically marginalized communities and those that are led by people of color. You can get intentional about that giving. So you can connect with one of the experts at CFT uh, to learn how you can chart a course of giving in a way that supports this work for your lifetime. You can share this event and this book. You can buy a copy uh, for yourself and a friend from our friends at Pan African and from Deep Bellum Bookstore. And certainly you can stay connected with CFT. Join us as we continue to have these conversations. And as we think about organizations that are doing this work, we would be remiss if we did not have the voice and the insight and the community charge from V, Jerry Hawkins, who leads Dallas Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. Yeah. In 2006, uh, CFT partnered with the Embry Foundation to bring together a diverse cross-sector team of leaders to develop and build out a truth, racial health, and transformation initiative for Dallas with support from the Kellogg Foundation. Give it up for Jerry. <laughs> the dedication and teaming of this great group of community leaders is ultimately what catalyzed Dallas Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation to become one of the strongest sites in the Kellogg Foundation's portfolio today. Jerry was hired in 2018 to serve as the executive director, and under his leadership, the DTRHT has grown into the thriving, teaching, convening, and advocacy organization that it is today. Jerry and his team are facilitating the kinds of conversations that are changing the fabric of our city. His intentionality, depth of insight, and grasp of the why is inspiring and challenging scores of us every day. Not only does he lead DTRHT, but he's also on the board of Deep Bellum. Jerry, would you join us? Thank you for that introduction, Chris. I uh, just really appreciate it. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Price and uh, Jim Schutz, uh, CFT, Deep Vellum. Um, I just really have three things I want to just convey to you about this book because it's really important. Um, I'm one of the folks who moved here 10 years ago, uh, read this book like it was four, uh, Fahrenheit 451. Uh, people were whispering about it like it was a secret. Um, and it was, uh, it tripped me out. I'm from south side of Chicago. Um, and I know the, fe the people in here, because there's some amazing people in here doing amazing work, uh, want to see a city that's better. And so number one, 
Read this book with other people. Do not read this book alone. Um, I want to shout out uh, my sister, uh, Bim Nett. Uh, Bim came to me. She's uh, uh, been in Dallas for most of her life. She's an a, a immigrant here, but she's been in Dallas most of her life, went to high school here, and she went to an event with Jim Shoots um, and a, a local playwright who is now uh, on, a, on a large TV show and said, I didn't know anything about my city. Jerry, can you do something for me? And she said, I want to start a book club. And if anybody knows me, I love books. I, book club, what am I going to do a book club, right? What are we going to do with a book club? But she was serious about it, started this book club, and by the end of the book club, it was like 70 people at our event. Um, we, we read this book for six months, slow read the book and had deep conversations about it. And I know the people were better for it and they were activated to do something in the city. So do not read this book alone, read it with other people. Um, the next thing I want to say to you is that people made this book release possible. Invest in people. Um, I want to just shout out a few people really important. Uh, Amber Sims, Young Leader Strong City, which is one of the, the uh, longest running racial justice organizations in the city. Beverly Wright, I see her. Uh, Dallas Dinner Table has been doing this work for a long time. Ashia Warren, Maggie Parker, Danita Quinn, Jamila Thomas, Jolie Robinson. There's a lot of important people doing amazing things, invest in what they're doing. I want to shout out Dr. Harry Robinson. I saw him in here. Dr. Harry Robinson is a legend. I was in D.C. talking about Dr. Robinson, and we need to support him and Dr. Delaney and what they're doing at the African American Museum. Diane Ragsdale and Marilyn Clark. Um, People who really, I know, are connected to this book. Krista Nightingale, who in D Academy uh, wanted to publish this book for Big D Reads, and now it's happening, so that's amazing. Uh, Jim Schutz, who is the author of this book and had uh, a lot of courage to do that. Um, Commissioner John Wiley Price, who remains uh, a truth teller and, and, and an inspiration for us all. And Will Evans. Where's Will at? Will is, the, is one of the most tenacious people in Dallas. Um, he is very serious about his work. He jokes a lot, but he is serious about his work and is serious about turning Dallas into a literary city. So shout out to Will. Um, the last thing is racial equity is about changing the material conditions of people who have been oppressed. Uh, this book can be a vehicle for healing only if you are activated to repair what has been harmed. So use this book um, as a, a, a catalyst to do something, read it and do something. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Hard to follow those two. That was outstanding. Um, good evening, everybody. And thank you, Jerry, so much. And thank you, Chris, for your uh, remarks. Um, I'm Dave Scullin. I'm the President and CEO of the Communities Foundation of Texas. Uh, and I just have a couple of things to express. So I'll be very brief before we close this evening. First, I am thrilled uh, by some of the great young leaders that we have here in our community. You heard some of them speak here tonight. I thought they did a fantastic job, and it makes me more optimistic about the future of what, what, what it is can happen. And then second, as we close this evening, I just want to confirm on behalf of CFT our commitment uh, to that advancing equity in this community is one of our three primary goals. The other two are more traditional, and you've heard us talk about them. Growing giving in this community, expanding a meaningful, measure, measurable, and, uh, and an, 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 a, an impact that will endure. Uh, and we believe all of those things. But the advancing equity item is just extremely important. We know that we have to go places that we haven't been before if we want to help be part of a community where everybody truly thrives. And I take the challenge that I've heard here this evening for us to do more of our part. And what are we doing? We're working on uh, incorporating equity and inclusion into every fabric of our organization's work. Uh, that means grant making, that means uh, donors, that means trustees, that means our staff. It's across the board. It's a, it's a long process, it's a slow process, and it doesn't happen overnight. But I'll tell you, we're starting to create dashboards to highlight measurable goals and, pre and create accountability for us. And we take that challenge to do more and do a lot more. But by the way, it was expressed here this evening extremely clearly that our community must continue to change and grow and we must learn from the past and what's been expressed. That's all true. And to do that, do we have a role? Yes. But guess what? 
uh, each of you here tonight needs to be part of that and driving and enabling that outcome. Uh, and so that's the challenge for each of you with us in a collaborative way. That's what tonight was all about. It was about coming together, listening and learning, all towards building something better. Guess what? We all have a huge stake in this future in our community together. It's, it's, we're all interconnected. This room tonight is filled with great people who have traveled different paths in their lives, but they all want to make Dallas better for our current and future generations. Please stay around a bit, purchase a book, enjoy dessert, have a drink, but mostly spend a little bit of time and talk a bit more to each other about what it is we've talked about here this evening. You know, hope is a great thing, uh, and hope is for us is that this conversation leads to collective actions that together lead to making for a much better community. Thank you so much for joining us this evening.